So I promised you that the Java Executor framework provides a way to decouple the creation and management of threads and thread pools from application logic. That clearly raises the question, what the heck is a thread pool? And so we're going to talk about what a thread pool is, and we'll also talk about why thread pools are good. And because I always love as much as possible to give human known uses of the different concepts we cover, I'll give you an example of a human known use of a thread pool, which you probably have dealt with quite a bit over time. So here's a kind of starting point. This is the context. Concurrent programs are often required to handle a large number of clients. So consider a web server that has to handle thousands of client requests simultaneously. You may have lots and lots of clients. For example, it's, it's Olympics this week and the next couple of weeks, and people like to go and do things like metal tracking or see what their favorite skater or skier or whatever is doing. So they go and hit the Olympic website. You can imagine there's a lot of people on the planet, and a lot of them want to see how the Olympics are going for their particular heroes and their particular country. So you need to build a scalable web solution to do that. And so concurrency is key to that. What we'd prefer not to do if we can avoid it, however, is have a thread per client. So let's say we have a million clients. We probably don't want a million threads. Now, if we start using Project Loom at some point, we may be able to have a million threads. But for right now, with traditional Java threads, which are the so-called platform threads, we don't want to have that many threads because they will overwhelm the resources. And this would be an example of how to write a program that would have a thread for every request. So every request comes in, we start a new thread, we make a new thread to handle the request, we start the thread, we end up with a gazillion threads. And chances are that will cause your machine to come to a screeching halt. And the reason for that is there's an excessive amount of memory needed to store all of these threads, and managing all those threads takes a lot of time as well. So even if you have a big honking server machine with lots of cores and lots of memory, it's still probably not a good idea to spawn a thread per request because you're going to run out of something at some point. And honestly, unless you have you know, a very, very, very large number of cores, it's probably not worthwhile having a thread for every Thing you're doing because they're just going to sit around in queues all the time and not get any more work done. So what's a better way to do things? Well, a better way to do things is often, not always, but often to use a thread pool. So we're going to have a pool of threads as opposed to what we had before, which was separate threads for every request. Why is this a win? Well, one thing it does is it helps to amortize the creation of threads and therefore the overhead of additional memory and processing. So we create them usually ahead of time. We'll say there's some variance there, but one thing to do is you create a number of threads up front and therefore the creation time for the threads, which is fairly expensive, is amortized over all the other uses. So here's an example. Rather than doing something like this where we make a new thread for every request, instead we create a thread pool and then when a request comes in, we say, hey, Hey, thread pool, take this request and run it on a free thread when one is available. And we'll see that that is a much more scalable way to do things. That, of course, raises another question. How big should the pool of threads be? And we're going to talk a lot about that. That's a very important topic. It's very subtle. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. But the size of the pool is typically determined by various factors, like the number of CPU cores. Do I have a, a thousand cores? Do I have two? Are the jobs, the tasks I'm trying to run compute bound, which means they aren't blocking on I.O., they're just doing processing in memory? Or are they I.O. bound, so they may block waiting for like disk traffic to settle or download files or streaming video or whatnot? So those are all things to take into account. We'll talk a lot more about that. There's a formula you'll have to learn to think about this. A thread pool is typically bound to a work queue of tasks that are awaiting execution. So when work comes in, rather than creating a new thread for them, we stick the work item onto a queue called a work queue, and then the threads in the pool will pull the items off the queue and, and process them. And I like to think, because again, I like to think visually, I think of worker threads like hungry puppies. So you've got this, this queue, and you've got these threads, and the Threads are like hungry puppies. They want to chomp away and get the next unit of work. Now, obviously, they're going to do something useful with them, not just like eat them. <laughs> but uh, the, the analogy should help you think about this. So the, the threads in the pool are eager like a puppy to do something useful. 
So now that I've given you a little tiny taste of what a thread pool is from a threading Java computational perspective, let's talk about a fun human unknown use of thread pools. So a great example of a human known use of thread pools is a call center. And you're probably familiar with call centers. If you're not familiar with call centers, you should consider yourself lucky. That means somebody else has always dealt with issues like dealing with your credit card if it gets hacked or trying to call the IRS if your taxes have got screwed up or whatever it is that you have to spend time on the line trying to wait to get an operator to help you. I saw this, um, saw this meme somewhere and I thought it was very clever. Operators are standing by, right? So only computer scientists would think that was funny. Everybody else would be like, what are those weird symbols and what do they have to do with operators? So of course, in a call center, you've got a bunch of operators that are standing around. This, this is obviously uh, not really a call center. It's an, early, it's an early telephone switch. Back in the day, they had manual operation of telecom switches and people would take pieces of cord and they would plug them together with patch cords. There was a point in time, like 100 years ago, where people thought that every man, woman, and child in America would have to work as a switching operator to handle the traffic of telephone calls as they increased. And of course, as with so many other things in life, automation came to the rescue. So we don't actually have to spend our lives connecting patch cords between different call uh, terminals, but we can have it done automatically. So that's a good example of a, of a thread pool. You've got a fixed number, typically a relatively small number of people who are the operators, and you've got lots of people calling. And that's why when you call a call center and there's no operator, they say, you know, your call is very important to us. Please remain on the line and your call will be answered in the order received. Or nowadays they say stuff like, you know, please enter a callback number and we'll call you back when we're available, right? So that's another way. So you don't have to sit there waiting. I'm, a, I'm an old school person, so I don't trust those callback things. So I stay on the line, right? I'm, I'm gonna like wait until they answer my call because I don't trust them to do them in the right order. But be that as it may, um, your, your mileage may differ. So that's the end of a quick overview of thread pools.